Many of you have heard me tell this joke, and it kind of sets up where we're going. But there was this girl that walked into church one day, and to be honest, she was dressed mildly inappropriately. Her her clothes, you know, were a little too revealing, and um, and and uh, it kind of caught the attention of some of the people, including the preacher. And at the end of the service, the preacher went to the back to shake everyone's hands as they were leaving, which was customary at the time. And uh, as the young woman came by, he said to her, young lady, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so thankful that you came today. Um, but before you come back next week, I, I, I'm going to ask you, pray and ask Jesus what he thinks you should wear before you come back into the church. And, uh, and the young woman left and came back the next week, and she was wearing the exact same outfit. And the preacher noticed, and this time he was a little bit frustrated. And uh, he stood at the back again when she came back through to, to leave. He said, young lady, thank you for coming back. I'm so happy you were here, but I've just got to ask you um, to, again, pray and ask Jesus what you should wear to come to church. She said, okay. And she left, and the next Sunday she came back in again wearing the exact same outfit. And so he preached his sermon, and then as, as, uh, as the young lady was walking out, he stopped her and he said, young lady, the last two weeks I have asked you to pray and ask Jesus what to wear when you come into this church. And she said, I did. And he told me he hasn't been here in so long, he's not sure. <laughs> and that's a funny joke, right? Where we, where we make fun of focusing on the wrong things. But today we look at a church that meets regularly that Jesus says makes him sick to his stomach to the point of vomiting. And he makes a statement at the end of his letter to this particular church that ties back to that. He says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We love that verse because we think of it as a verse of evangelism. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone will let me come in, I will come in and eat with him. And that Jesus is ready for, for that. And, and, and it's true, okay? That is true, and it is an application of this verse in conjunction with a lot of other scriptures. But specifically, the passage we're going to look at today in Revelation chapter 3, he is talking to a church, and Jesus is saying, behold, I stand at the door of your church and knock if anyone will let me in I'll come in can I just tell you that my greatest fear for our church is that somehow we could show up on a Sunday and we could sing songs we could have incredible music we could have prayers I could preach God's word and we could walk out and Jesus never have even been here and none of us notice And that's exactly who Jesus is talking to in Revelation chapter 3 when we look at the church at Laodicea. Jesus has written seven letters through John to seven different churches. To the first church, he says, look, I, my problem with you is you've lost your first love. And then he goes through all the other uh, five churches before he comes to the seventh church in verse 14 of chapter 3. And we read this. And I want to point this out before we even start. If you listen to this, I would argue that this is possibly the greatest picture of the American church in all of the Bible verse 14 write to the angel of the church in Laodicea the word angel here probably doesn't literally mean angelic being it's probably referring to the pastor of the church and his in his desire to uh, to to teach and lead thus says the amen the faithful and true witness the originator of God's creation I could spend all day just on those truths about who Jesus is the fact that he is faithful and true and the fact that he is the beginning of all creation. But we don't have time for that because that's not our focus today. Verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed from your shameful nakedness and not be exposed. 
and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. He's saying, look, I'm telling you this not because I hate you. I'm telling you this because I love you. And so I want to discipline you. I want to help you. So be zealous and repent. And then he makes that statement, verse 20. See, I stand at the door and knock. I wonder how many churches I wonder how many believers here today would know if he wasn't in the room. Or have we gotten so apathetic? Have we become so comfortable and complacent that we don't even really feel like we need Jesus? And that's why we turn to him when things go bad. We turn to Jesus when our life is in the pit, when everything's going to hell. We turn to Jesus. We turn to Jesus when we don't know what's going to happen when the diagnose, with the diagnosis. We turn to Jesus when we don't know what's going to happen with our job. We turn to Jesus when we're out of money. We turn to Jesus when things have gone bad relationally. We turn to Jesus when everything goes terrible. But for the most part, we just live our lives because it's good enough because we're enough i want to remind you what we just sang i'm not enough unless you come i asked bill for us to do that song this morning because that song ties so much to what we are talking about today we are not enough you are not enough i am not enough unless he comes So I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I want to ask this question today and try to answer it from this passage. How do we get to the point that Jesus is on the outside of the church trying to get in? How do we get to the point where Jesus is on the outside of the church trying to get in? I want you to understand, I'm not expecting a bunch of amens today because today is one of those days that I'm going to get a lot of people saying, ow, my toes hurt. And the reason I can tell you that is because I've been getting body punched by this verse all week. And I know what we're going to talk about today hurts. But because Christ loves us, he wants to challenge us and rebuke us and correct us. And that's why we have this verse. So how do we get to the point that Jesus is on the outside of the church trying to get in? Well, first, let's look at the condition of the church at Laodicea. First, let's look at the condition of the church at Laodicea. And here we're going to see where I believe we'll notice a lot of common threads. Beginning back at verse 14, write to the angel of the Lord at Laodicea, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, but neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, I want to clear up some things because as a young person, even as a young believer, maybe even as a young preacher, I preach this wrongly, okay? Jesus is not saying to the people in the church here, I wish that you were either either passionately hot about me or you were just completely cold about me. But because you're in the middle, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus isn't saying, I wish you were just cold and didn't even care about me. This is an instance where we have to understand the context to whom this was written. When you write a letter to me, it means something specific to me. And if somebody else reads it and they don't have our context, they don't understand our ability to talk, they don't understand my surroundings, then they may not understand. If you said, you know what I could really go for is some good sweet tea, right? Well, people in the north, they, half of them don't even know what sweet tea is because you can't buy it anywhere except for Cracker Barrel up there. If you say, I want a grit, right? You might say, I want some sweet tea and grits, and somebody, somebody might say, what's a grit, right? Because our context answers that question. And yes, you can buy it at Chick-fil-A. Don't, don't, I call, I got you. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the thing. If we don't understand the context of Laodicea, we'll miss We'll miss Jesus' point here. See, what you need to understand is Laodicea was a part of Asia Minor, and around Laodicea, were two, there were two main cities, one about six miles one direction, one about 10 miles another direction. And Laodicea was on this plain, and there was actually no real springs of water on this plain. 
And so to have water in the city, they had to pipe it in. And so they would pipe in water from the two local, town, uh, the two local areas, Colossae, where we get the book of Colossians, and then another area called, called Hierapolis. Now in Hierapolis, what happened was there were these hot springs that were known for their medicinal values. Some of you maybe have even gone to a hot spring for some healing, like it's, apparently it's something good, you put the mud on you, and I don't understand any of that, but apparently it's a good thing, right? And I, I equate it to, you know, when you've had a long day at work, not a hot day, but just a long day at work, you know what my favorite thing to do after a long day at work is? A good, hot shower, right? Just makes me feel rejuvenated when I get that good, hot shower. And so they would pipe in this water from Hierapolis, but it had to come around six miles through these stone uh, through this stone aqueduct system. So guess what happens when you send hot water through a pipe six miles? It's not very hot when it gets there, right? So then, that's why, that's why you know, the, 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 the shower the farthest from the hot water heater in your house doesn't get as hot as the one closer, right? Because it's got to go farther. It's the same idea. And so, so they would get this lukewarm water from these hot water uh, hot water pipes flowing from the hot springs. Well, then over in Colossae, it was kind of in a mountainous area, and these cold rivers would come down from the mountain. I mean, ice cold, kind of like, you know what I'm talking about, like, uh, like rafting on the Natahala, cold, like brrr, cold. And it would be so freezing cold, but then it would have to travel through about 10 miles of pipe. And what happens when it travels through 10 miles of pipe? It warms up. So now, you know, when it's hot outside, I mean, when it's, it's the kind of hot it's been lately, you know what I'm talking about? When it's that kind of hot, I love a cold glass of water. I don't want a bottle of water that's been riding alongside of me in the lawnmower for the last two hours. I want the one that's cold, right? Because it's refreshing. It refreshes me. And so when Jesus is talking to the people at Laodicea, he's not like, the problem is I wish you were either cold or hot in your passion for me. Now, God doesn't want anybody to be cold in passion for him. He's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. What he's saying is, I wish you were useful. I wish you were, I wish you in your life you were hot towards me and you helped provide healing towards people. Or I wish you were cold in your cold and useful so that you could provide refreshment people for people. But instead, you're stuck in the middle, and to be honest, you're not good for anything. Some of you, you love hot coffee. I'm talking about so hot it burns your mouth all the way down. Hot. Like the kind of hot that you pour on something just to open it up. It's just crazy. Some of you, you love iced coffee. Mm, some of you right now, you're going, yes, Lord. But you know what really nobody likes? The coffee that's been sitting there since this morning on the table. Has it just gotten old and stale and room temperature? That's how God feels about the church, the apathy of the church. He calls them lukewarm. And I, want, I want to give you some examples of a lukewarm Christian, a, a lukewarm church, and, and kind of help you understand what this looks like. When you're stale and apathetic, when you're lukewarm as a believer, you gather when it's convenient. You gather when it's convenient, but if there's something else that's a little more interesting today, to be honest, I mean, to be honest, I got to make sure that I get all my cooking done for the uh for the football game this afternoon because i got people coming over or to be honest I, I mean i probably shouldn't have stayed up so late last night but i did stay up too late so i'm just gonna sleep in this morning i'm just gonna gather when it's convenient but if it's not convenient i'm just not gonna worry about it lukewarm people they give as long as it's comfortable i'm happy to give some of my money as long as things are going well I mean, if things are going well, I'm happy to give my time as long as I'm not really being pushed for time. If things are going well, as long as I'm comfortable, I don't mind sharing my talent as long as you're not going to ask me to do it in an uncomfortable way. We give as long as it's comfortable when we're a lukewarm person. But see, a person who is useful to God, a person not wrapped in apathy and in complacency, they give till it hurts. 
Yes, financially, they give till there's a strain. Yes, from a time standpoint, they're looking around at the end of the day going, where did the time go? And I still have stuff to do because they're pushing themselves and they're calling themselves to do more and more for the glory of God and for the sake of taking the gospel to the nations and across the street. And these people, they go as long as it's conducive. As long as it fits my schedule, I'll go. But don't ask me to have a conversation that's too hard. Don't ask me to make a commitment that's too much. I'd rather just kind of sit instead of serve. I'd rather settle for just some emotional highs in my relationship than a constant connection with the Lord. See, the truth is a lukewarm person, they want Jesus as a part of their life. But here's my promise to you. Jesus never intended to be a part of your life. Hear me clearly. Jesus doesn't want to be a part of your life. Some of you right now are getting really confused because you just woke up and caught just that line and now you're confused. Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life. Jesus wants to be all of your life. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And the problem is we want to give God part of our life, but not all of our life. And because of that, we're apathetic. And by the way, if you're an apathetic person, you're just a pathetic person. We're complacent. And we just make God want to vomit. That's the condition of the church at Laodicea. And I would argue that it's possibly the condition of many churches here in America because of the cause of the condition we're about to see. Look, we're going to now see the cause of that condition of apathy. Verse 17, for you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The, P- the people of Laodicea, they felt like they had everything they needed. This was one of the richest cities in the entire Roman Empire. Let me give you an example. In A.D. 60, there was a major earthquake. Some argue that it could have been over a Richter scale size 8. Okay, so I mean, this is a major earthquake. Destroyed cities all across Asia Minor. So the Roman Empire sent money out to all the different cities to help them rebuild. Sounds like a good Roman Emperor FEMA. I don't know. So they send all this money out. Laodicea gets the money. And guess what Laodicea does? Sends it back. We don't need your money. You you just take your little money and you just do whatever you will with it, Mr. Roman Emperor. We got enough to do what we want to do. We're self-sufficient. We're self-reliant. We, we're fine. We don't need your help. Why? Because they had so much. They were at the center of a, of a bunch of uh, different trade routes coming together. And so they were at the center of all this trade. Financially, they were, an incre- they were incredibly wealthy. Notice what it said. It said uh, that you are wretched, pitiful, and then it says you are poor, blind, and naked. This is incredibly important. Why is it incredibly important? Number one, the people of Laodicea were actually very financially wealthy. Lots of money. I mean, lots of money. In the ancient world, the size of your house told a lot about how much money you had because you had the ability to build. Understand this, that many of the houses in Laodicea were similar size to the houses that we have here in America. By the way, the average house size in America, 2,100 plus square feet, that's the second largest in all the world on average. It says, you're poor, you're blind. This is important because... Laodicea was known for making this eye salve that would help people who would come with blindness and different things and they would be blind and they would use this eye salve that these incredible doctors in Laodicea had developed so that they could cure blindness and yet Jesus says you're blind you're poor you're blind you're naked this is important because guess what one of the chief exports of Laodicea was it was black wool Because in their area, there were many black sheep, and they had this incredible black wool, and they were known for their linen. It was one of the most popular types of linen. Jesus points directly to everything they believe makes them self-sufficient and said, you actually have none of these things. But they had begun to believe that they were good enough on their own. Jesus talks about this after talking to the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 to 24. It says that he said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it'd be hard for a rich person, 
harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, many people have said, there was a specific gate, that's the eye of the needle is what it was called, and it was hard to get. Now, I really believe this is just Jesus being very clear. It would be harder to pull a camel through the eye of a needle than it would for a rich man to go. Why? Because when we're wealthy, we think we've got everything we need. I'm financially sound. I'm physically sound. I must not be spiritually in trouble. And that's why I say this applies very much to the church here in America. You might say, well, Chris, that might be true for the rich people, but I'm not rich. Aren't you? Aren't you? You drive here today? Did you have more than three outfits in your closet when you got up this morning? Did you have fresh running water? Did you have so much fresh running water that you actually pumped some through a heater so that you could have a hot shower? When you go home, are there groceries in the shelf? I know it may not be what you want, but is there ramen? You need to understand this. We are rich in comparison. We really are. Maybe you, pastor, but not me. No, we're all rich. Do you realize that most families in America have more cars than the average family outside of America has rooms in their home? Stop and think about that. We are rich. And because of that, We think that everything's A-OK. God's happy with us because He's blessed us with these things, so we must be good. It must be good. According to one annual survey, the average people thought that the average income of an American was around $21,000 a year take-home pay. That's what people said. And they felt like that was probably low because there are many poor people in America. Do you realize that the average amount of money a person makes across the world in a year the average is about twenty one hundred dollars a year guys we're rich and if we're not careful apathy sneaks in because we have what we need and since we don't feel like we need god for physical needs we don't feel like we need him for anything and so this apathy and this complacence sets in We feel like we have everything we need, so why do we need God? Thankfully, Jesus gives them the cure for this condition in verses 18 and 19. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. Remember, they thought they were rich. Jesus says, buy from me gold. White clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness may be exposed. Remember, they thought that they had fancy clothes made of black wool. Jesus says, buy from me white linens that are pure so that you, your nakedness can be clothed. And ointment spread on your eyes so that you may see. They thought they made ointment that would make people be able to see. Jesus says, no, you need to have your eyes opened. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Again, Jesus isn't saying, I hate you. He's saying, I want you to change because I love you. So be zealous and repent. Here he tells us how we can be cured of the condition of complacency or apathy. First, realize your condition. Everything they thought made them great, God said those things have actually made you terrible. You're not rich. You think you're rich, you're not rich. You think you got these fancy clothes, but to be honest, that's not the clothes you need. You think you're healing other people, but what you need is to be healed. So first, we have to realize our condition. Second, we have to return to Christ. The word here translated be zealous at the end of this verse. The word literally means to pursue or chase after. And so it's interesting that he uses this idea, be zealous and repent. Because the repent means to turn away from and go another direction. So he's saying, turn away from and pursue. So the problem is, because of all that we have, we've just kind of walked away from God because we don't need Him, and the response is to turn away from what we have and to pursue Jesus. That's our proper response. What does this look like in us? 
ultimately this looks like in us new priorities. See, when we repent of sin and pursue God, God is there for us and he puts in us new desires. The Bible says that, uh, that God cre- gives us the desires of our heart. That means he literally gives us new desires. He doesn't just give us the things we want. He makes us want new things so that then he can give them to us. And so he gives us these new priorities. We're going to have them on the screen because we've got to move quickly. First, our new priorities look like this, prayer instead of pastimes. We spend time in prayer rather than playing on our phone or rather than playing so much golf or rather than working on the woodworking. And I'm not saying any of those things is bad, but if we're doing those and we're not praying, that's a problem. That means we've prioritized the wrong thing. Another, another new priority be, would, would be scriptures instead of screens. Now, I know what you're saying. Chris, I read my Bible on my screen. I read it on my iPad. I have the YouVersion Bible app. That's how I read my Bible. Yeah, but let's be honest. That's not what you mostly do on your screens. Whether we're talking about TV, whether we're talking about the tablet or the computer or the phone. But we begin to focus on our Scripture. What if we spent as much time, just stop and think about this, what if we had spent as much time reading Scripture as we had looking at Facebook? We probably would have easily been able to complete two chapters a day during the F-260 new priorities giving instead of gathering instead of gathering up just to hoard for ourselves we'll be generous we'll want to give to people serving instead of sitting last week we had we had over 50 people down in the children's area last week they were absolutely swamped with children praise god that's what we want that's the way we want it but man in the world in our world in the church world we say there's two types of problems there's good problems and bad problems but they're both problems Those are good problems. That's a good problem. It's a great problem. And it's a problem that can be answered when some people decide to start serving and quit sitting. And they get some new priorities and quit being apathetic or complacent. Leads to conversation instead of comfort. In other words, we're going to have those hard convos. You know, the ones that you're not sure how your neighbor's going to respond to, but they need to know about Jesus. The one that you don't know if you're going to get invited back to dinner at your grandma's house. But she needs to know about Jesus. And it leads to Jesus instead of jobs. Some of y'all right now are very confused. But here's what I, here, here's what I mean. What if, what if, to be all that you needed to be for Jesus, it meant doing something different than what you do? But Chris, I've been working to get ahead in this industry for 30 years. What if? I'm not saying you have to leave your job. I'm just saying your priority should be Jesus, not your job. I'm saying you might need to give up something, that overtime check, that extra, so that you can focus on Jesus instead of just your job. See, when our new priorities are Jesus, then everything else comes in secondary. I heard one guy say it this way. He said, I started thinking of my life. He worked in the business world. He said, I started looking at my life and I realized my job was to be a full-time Christian and a part-time business person. Now, I still work 40 hours a week, but my primary responsibility, my first responsibility is to be a Christian. And secondly, it's to be a business person. Is your first responsibility to be a teacher or to be a Christian? It's your first responsibility to be a business person, an engineer, a financial helper. Whatever your job is, is your first priority to be that or is it to be a Jesus follower? That tells where your priorities are. Lastly, and this is the most important thing, we see the commitment from Jesus. Verse 20. And our people are going to go ahead and come and prepare. We're going to sing at the end of this, but I, I want to go ahead and get them moving. So if you want to go ahead and start moving. But listen closely to verse 20. Again, we've, we've quoted this verse multiple times, but it says what? See, I stand at the door and knock. That's so scary that Jesus could be outside of the church and people not even notice. That people, Jesus could be out there banging, begging, come in, let me in, I want to come to be with you. And nobody even hears because we're so enveloped in ourselves. But the promise of Jesus' faithfulness is this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. 
and I'll eat with him. In other words, we'll be in relationship. We'll be together. And he'll be with me. The great hope is this, believer. If you are apathetic and complacent and you repent and pursue, Jesus is already standing right there. If you open the door, he is ready to come in. And so, believer, I ask you, can we quit focusing on ourselves and start focusing on Jesus and the need for the gospel to go out to the world? Or will we be the apathetic church, the lukewarm church that's not refreshing, not healing or comforting, but just is kind of here, and we don't even notice when Jesus doesn't show up? What type of church will we be? We will be a church, a group of believers who decide whether they want to be apathetic and complacent or whether they want to pursue the Lord. Now, if you're here today, I want you to understand one thing. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I want you to understand He really is standing at your door, the door to your life, and knocking. Right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, saying, through these words, not because my words are special, but because they're His words, saying, we've all sinned, and our only hope for that sin is Jesus Christ. And if we'll put our faith in Christ, we can be forgiven and we can have new life. The question is, are you going to open the door and let him in? If you do, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness if we confess our sins. I don't know how you need to respond. But whatever that is, we'll have care team people in the back to help you. We'll have care team people at the front to help you when we stand. But as we sing, if you don't feel like you can sing these words, don't. But if you mean it when you say to God, I'm not enough unless you come, meet with me again. You're saying, Lord, I want the door to be open so Jesus can always come in. Man, sing that like you mean it. And after we're done singing, let's go live it like we mean it too. Would you stand and respond as we sing?